Owen in the broad jump. It's Jesse Owen. The kind of power you get in errors. Li Flying to you as it is to me and to the rest of us. What is lost media? The phrase itself explains it. It's media that is believed to no longer exist in any format or for which any copies cannot be located. The term primarily encompasses visual, audio, or audiovisual media such as films, television, radio broadcasts, music, video games, and photographs. In the silent era of movies, when home media did not exist in any form, many films that showed in the theaters and went through their rotations would then be locked away at the studio that developed them. But film back then was made of a highly flammable nitrate material, and so films literally going up in smoke due to fires was commonplace. Also, motion picture studios often destroyed their original nitrate film elements, as film and broadcast material was often considered ephemeral and of little historical worth after they had made their revenue. Fast forward to the analog age of media, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, when television and radio broadcast masters recorded onto magnetic tape would be lost due to the industry practice of wiping to replace tapes with new footage. And with the lack of an online medium, new stories and videos wouldn't be stored in perpetuity for the public. Even in the modern internet age, lost media is still commonplace. Media released on the internet, such as live streams and blog posts, are vulnerable to being lost due to a number of issues, such as a website being shut down, the content being deleted by the creator without getting archived, or never having been archived in the first place. Without a doubt, what interests me about lost media is the element of mystery and intrigue. The idea that something was once available but is now missing gives me a sense of curiosity and a desire to uncover what truly happened. While lost media can be anything from an unaired portion of a TV show that didn't make the cut due to runtime to a song that was recorded but never released on the airwaves, tonight we will be focusing on darker, more unnerving lost media and specifically real world incidents that were captured on some form of medium. Welcome to the flagship episode of The Dark Ives, a descent into dark lost media. It's intriguing to consider lost media in the context of the pre-television era of the 1930s and 1940s, where the focus is primarily on lost films and photos, as these were the primary mediums for viewing during that time. While many people believe that television and live broadcasts didn't emerge until the 1950s, this is not entirely accurate. The home television became affordable to the public in the early 1950s, but television as a medium was actually invented in 1927. And throughout the 1930s and 1940s, fledgling television studios were conducting broadcast tests and experiments. One notable broadcast test was conducted by NBC in New York City in 1938. And the event that they captured live would be remembered as one of the most shocking events ever caught on camera at the time. In 1938, in New York City, Marion Perloff, a stenographer and clerk working on the 11th floor of the Time and Life building in Rockefeller Center's Plaza for Girl Scouts, suffered a nervous breakdown. 
The breakdown was triggered by a man rejecting her marriage proposal at the last moment. Resulting from this, Perloff was forced to take a vacation to reduce her stress levels. However, on the 23rd of June, 1938, colleagues reported she entered the office in a significantly anxious state. To try and calm Perloff, some of her co-workers invited her to a work picnic. However, Perloff insisted she needed to phone her sister and walked away for a moment. Some of Perloff's colleagues then began searching for her, as she had suddenly vanished just before the buses for the picnic were set to depart. What they had yet to realize was that Perloff had made the decision to end her own life by jumping out of the office's window. Meanwhile, NBC was conducting outside tests for its fledgling television service. At the time, NBC was off air, with the test being directed by NBC's chief engineer, O.B. Hansen, and others who were viewing footage at the fifth floor of the RCA building. Cameraman Ross Plasted was harnessing a brand new mobile unit, capturing footage and audio across Radio City, including the Time and Life building. At some point prior to 3.30 p.m., Hansen directed Plasted to capture the front of the RCA building. As Plasted turned the camera, he spotted the distressing sight of Perloff about to jump from the Time and Life building. Witnessing her jump, a shocked Plasted uttered, My God! before directing the camera to the woman falling from the sixth floor onwards. Plasted continued filming as a large crowd of around 2,000 formed. In an interview with the press, Placid explained what he and the engineers witnessed, stating, When I turned my camera towards the Time and Life building, I saw a falling body. My camera picked her up as she passed the sixth floor and I followed her down. Perloff's picture was the first to ever be captured by television cameras, making it one of the earliest examples of lost media. No photos or footage of the incident are known to have survived because coverage of the event was captured live and was not recorded, and so it is considered fully and permanently lost. The Marion Perloff incident was a harrowing event that showed to many that with the advent of recorded visual media, tragic incidents could be captured for posterity, however unintentional. In fact, radio and print outlets in an attempt to stop television's growth began spreading a moral panic concerning television, potentially capturing other controversial and tasteless incidents, which clearly failed in the long run. In any case, this incident serves as a tragic reminder of the profound impact of mental health challenges on individuals and communities. Marion Perloff's story while a heartbreaking episode in the history of media, also underscores the responsibility media professionals carry in handling sensitive content with care and respect. The ethical implications of capturing and broadcasting such events, even in a time before the ubiquity of television, are profound and continue to be relevant today. In 1998, the Bradley family decided to take a vacation cruise around the Caribbean on a liner called Rhapsody of the Seas in order to celebrate 23-year-old Amy Lynn Bradley getting a new job at a computer consulting firm. The family was sailing to the Dutch island of Curaçao. In transit to the island on the 23rd of March, Amy and her brother Brad partied into the late hours of the night in the Mardi Gras nightclub of the ship, where a band called Blue Orchid was playing. One of the band members named Alistair Douglas, aka Yellow, could be seen in video footage dancing with Amy. The video footage would become prominent after the events that would soon transpire, because this footage would be the last known video of Amy to this day. After coming back from the nightclub, 
Brad and Amy sat on their family's suite's balcony before Brad went to sleep, leaving Amy alone on the balcony. By 6 a.m. that day, as the sun was rising above the sea's horizon, Amy was no longer on the family's balcony, and was in fact nowhere to be found. The last confirmed sighting of Amy was between 5.15 and 5.30 a.m. when her father, Ron Bradley, got up and saw her sleeping out on the balcony. Her father was immediately alarmed because it was apparently unlike Amy to leave and not say where she was going. What was even more strange was that all she had apparently taken with her were her cigarettes and a lighter, indicating that if she had left of her own accord, she had not intended to go very far. The Bradley family alerted the crew, begging them to stop the boat from disembarking and to make an announcement about Amy's disappearance. Their pleas were oddly rejected. In fact, the ship arrived at Curacao with no restrictions placed on the movement of the other 2,000 guests on board, a complete faux pas for a missing persons case on a nautical vessel. An announcement was finally made at 7.50 a.m., nearly two hours after Amy was reported missing by her father, Ron, and the announcement itself was a brief, discreet one that simply asked Amy to come to the purser's desk. Further searches of both the island and the ship by the family, the crew, the Dutch Caribbean Coast Guard, and the FBI turned up nothing. It was as if Amy had literally vanished into thin air. In the years that followed, many theories as to what happened to Amy cropped up, one of which suggested she had simply fallen off the side of the boat and into the sea. But the more accepted theory was that she was likely kidnapped and subsequently sold into sex trafficking. In the years that followed, several alleged sightings of Amy were reported, supporting the idea at the time that she may still yet be alive. In August 1998, a Canadian tourist named David Carmichael encountered an English-speaking woman in Curacao who matched Amy's description, including her distinctive tattoos. Another sighting in January 1999 involved a U.S. Navy officer who claimed to have seen Amy in a brothel in the Caribbean, where she allegedly begged him for help. In 2005, another tourist, a Judy Mauer, reported seeing a woman claiming to be Amy in Barbados. Amy Bradley's disappearance is surrounded by unsettling allegations of potential conspiracy involving the ship's crew. Research suggests that the crew may have obstructed the search for Amy by ways such as not stopping the boat and, of course, as we said previously, allowing passengers to move freely on and off the ship and making minimal announcements about her disappearance. These actions have led to suspicions that Amy may have been trafficked, possibly with the involvement of the crew of the Rhapsody. Apparently, during the cruise, there were many instances where the staff of the Rhapsody, including the ship's captain, exhibited unusual behavior towards Amy and gave her constant, special, unwarranted attention. For example, a waiter reportedly made Amy uncomfortable by repeatedly trying to separate her from her family, and the captain refused to share a photo of Amy to alert other passengers citing concerns about causing alarm on the ship. There's also Alistair Yellow Douglas, the band member of the Blue Orchid who interacted with Amy the night she disappeared. Apparently, he had expressed condolences to Amy's brother, despite the fact that Amy's family and the ship's security were the only ones that were aware of her disappearance. Another peculiar aspect of the case, and the one that relates to lost media, is the missing cruise pictures. Passengers often have their pictures taken on cruise ships to be sold back to them later. Amy and her family were no exception to this, and pictures were taken of them by a professional photographer. 
However, the night before Amy disappeared, her pictures, and only her pictures, went missing from the display, and their whereabouts remain unknown. The photographer himself had no recollection of what happened to the photos. Despite being declared dead in 2010, the public search for answers in the Amy Bradley case continues. However, officially, the case is cold, and it appears unlikely to be solved anytime soon. The missing pictures could potentially hold crucial information about her disappearance, as it is speculated that they may have been deliberately hidden to hinder the search. Whatever the case, Amy Bradley's disappearance serves as a stark warning to all those who travel abroad. It highlights the potential dangers and vulnerabilities travelers may face, even in seemingly safe environments. It's a tragic reminder that while travel can be enriching and fulfilling, it also comes with risks that should not be taken lightly. Amy's story has sparked discussions about safety measures for travelers and has brought attention to the issue of human trafficking, urging authorities and individuals alike to take action to prevent similar tragedies. Is there such a thing as too much compassion? Where does the line between recklessness and a desire to help become blurred? This question has been asked many times of rogue conservationist and bear enthusiast Timothy Treadwell, known now as the Grizzly Man. A man of contradictions, Treadwell found solace and purpose in the heart of the wilderness observing and caring for the local wildlife in an Alaskan preserve called Katmai National Park. Timothy was someone who didn't feel like he fit in with society. He felt like an outcast, not properly wired for human civilization. Treadwell had spent 13 summers living with the bears of Katmai National Park and had documented upwards of 100 hours of footage over that period. He felt more at home, more at peace, and more accepted in the wild. It was all he truly cared about, and he would travel by himself deep into bear territory in Katmai, interacting with various bears and even naming them. As stated before, Treadwell carried with him recording equipment, including a camera, so he could record himself in the wild, interacting with animals, mostly bears, and recording his own soliloquies on nature, the importance of animals, the beauty of isolation, and his detestment for society and the human world. In contrast to what Timothy thought he was doing for the wildlife of Katmai and the environment at large, Tom Smith, a research ecologist with the Alaska Science Center of the U.S. National Geological Survey, declared that Treadwell was breaking every park rule that there was. In terms of distance to the bears, harassing wildlife, and interfering with natural processes. Whatever you may think, Treadwell did indeed have a deep and unwavering love for animals, and the bear sanctuary inside Katmai was the only place he felt oneness. Despite his love of isolation and his apparent disdain for societal norms, Treadwell eventually began dating his partner, Amy Huguenard, who began accompanying him on his trips to Katmai, despite the fact that she herself wasn't much of an outdoorsy person and was said to be even afraid of bears, sadly writing in her diary that she didn't want to go to or stay in Katmai. In October of 2003, Treadwell had returned to Katmai with Amy now this time was well after the safe zone of being near the bear sanctuary, simply because the closer to winter meant the bears would become more desperate to find food for hibernation, meaning they were typically more vicious around this time. Treadwell set his campsite near a salmon stream, 
where wild bears commonly fed in the autumn. At some point, during their extended trip, Treadwell and Amy encountered a violent adult grizzly bear near their campsite. Willie Fulton, a Kodiak air taxi pilot, arrived at Treadwell and Amy's campsite to pick them up, but found the area abandoned, except for a bear, and contacted the local park rangers. The couple's mangled remains were discovered soon after. The horrific scene shocked the rangers as they searched the campsite, and eventually they found a video camera. And on that camera was an audio recording of the couple's death. It seems Amy had turned on the camera but forgot to remove the lens cap. On the tape, only voices and cries can be heard as a brown bear mauled Treadwell to death. According to authorities, the tape begins with Treadwell yelling that he is being attacked, saying, Come out here. I'm being killed out here. It's believed the bear, named Bear 141, was one that even Treadwell feared. It attacked Treadwell, killed him, dragged his body into the woods, and Amy chased after the bear and Timothy, only to be attacked and killed herself. The audio tape of the attack was given to an ex-girlfriend of Timothy's named Jewel Palavac, filmmaker Werner Herzog, who directed the documentary Grizzly Man, is one of the few people who have listened to the audio tape, and he did so on camera for his own film. Though he listened to the tape, the audio was not played for the viewer. After listening for only a few seconds, he sadly asked for the tape to be shut off, and in distress, implored Jewel to destroy the tape. Palavac has never listened to the tape, but she didn't destroy it, opting instead to keep it locked away until the end of time. Timothy Treadwell was a complicated but passionate person who seemed to truly care for animals. His connection with the natural world was profound, perhaps even spiritual. Treadwell's devotion to the bears of Katmai National Park went beyond mere interest or study. It was a deep-seated bond that defined his existence. Timothy Treadwell's story is a tragic reminder of the complexities of human nature and our relationship to the natural world. He may have been a controversial figure in life, but his passion for animals and the wilderness he called home is a testament to the power of compassion and the bonds that can form between man and beast. And his final moments, etched onto that tape, will likely never be heard. And it's probably for the best. The world of exploring the darker corners of lost media is one that both excites and unnerves. On one hand, there is a sense of curiosity and intrigue surrounding these elusive pieces of content. The desire to uncover the truth behind these lost works, to answer lingering questions, and to piece together fragments of the past can be a powerful driving force. However, there is also a recognition that some lost media is better left untouched and not consumed. There is a delicate balance between the thrill of discovery and the responsibility to approach lost media with caution and sensitivity. Thank you for watching the flagship episode of The Dark Ives. Stay tuned for more. I appreciate your presence here. See you next time.